Good evening and uh, welcome to uh, Look Up Amsterdam. As you can tell, we're, we're live in Amsterdam, so we've suddenly got flashing lights right outside of us. Uh, I hope that's not going to bother you too much. They're going to move on in just a second. But we thought we should uh, try and start, start roughly on time. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is uh, Simon and uh, I am a uh, historian. Uh, and so I'm going to be bringing you some uh, examples of historical art as we work through the course of the evening and uh, particularly as we look through this whole theme of like what is the perfect how do you find uh, perfection and we, with me tonight is my name is Leah um, Leah Sands I'm also uh, here to talk about art um, I'm an artist um, but I'll be talking about some art that's happening a little bit before um, yeah, in the past 100 years, a little bit before what Simon's going to be talking about. Um, so as we, we look through this whole theme, um, I'm just wondering, we just got, might have a little technical issue. No. Uh, so as we look at this whole theme, we are going to start uh, roughly around the 1500s. But because of being a historian, you want to always set a little bit of background. And I think it's really important when we look at the background of art in the 1500s, then obviously before that comes the 1400s. And before there was the Northern Renaissance, there was the Italian Renaissance. So if you want to look at what the image of perfection was, then I don't think there's any better uh, picture to start with than this particular image, which is image by Piero della Francesca of resurrection. It was a really clear idea that the perfect was meant to be Jesus. And certainly through the ages, certain people have continued to see this as the perfect painting. Aldous Huxley, for example, said it was the greatest painting ever. But what I want us to look at it for is the fact that it pictures perfection in a particular way, which is not the majority way that we're going to be able to look at it uh, through the rest of the evening. In that you've got this kind of... Uh, anatomically well-developed, uh, shall we just say, or buff-looking Jesus figure. And he is there with a, some perfect mathematical proportions. So you'll see that he is exactly a third of the way up the painting. And you'll also see that he's exactly in the middle. So you've got this real centering of the idea of like, in the center is this perfect person. You've also got some classic symbolism here. So to the left, we've got dead trees. To the right, we've got live trees symbolizing this whole resurrection thing. And we're going to be looking at these themes of like what makes the perfect person. We're also going to be looking at the whole concept of cycles of life uh, as we, and the whole concept as well of the abstract or sometimes even the mathematical as a way of looking at perfection. But traveling down to Italy uh, in the 1500s and returning was a guy that is actually our start point for this evening, which is... Peter Bruchel, the Elder. Now, if you are a uh, non-Dutch person, you've probably always called him Peter Bruegel, uh, if you've heard of him, or if you're a Dutch person, you probably think my pronunciation of Bruchel is still not that great. But nonetheless, I'm trying my hardest. Now, you, probably if you've seen a perfect image by Bruchel before, it would have been those Christmas cards of people out there in the snow. But what you might not know is that those Christmas cards are part of a series. And in that series is a pic particular painting called The Return of the Herd. And that's the one we're going to come to in a minute. But before we get there, I want to say why I actually started on him. And it's because of this particular painting. And this painting is called The Land of Cocaine, or uh, Laulacraland. And the idea here is perfection is achieved by having everything you could possibly ever want. So we've got these guys just filled up on all the food they could possibly want. But actually, as you see, this is not perfection at all. Now, if you're really interested in this painting, what my suggestion is, is go to our YouTube where you already are, but click the subscribe button because we're gonna, I'm actually going to put a separate video on about this uh, painting in the upcoming weeks. But that was simply the gateway into looking at Bruchel. And as I said, where we ended up was, we ended up looking at a particular series of paintings about the seasons. And the one that I want to focus on tonight, we're going to return to a couple of times, is called uh, Return 
of the herd. And this takes us into our theme, our first theme, which is people and perfection. We've seen how the kind of anatomically perfect Jesus figure was with the halo, but actually we want to move on to a different concept of the average person being an image of perfection. And Bruchel is a super interesting guy because he was known as a wedding crasher. He actually would deliberately dress up as a peasant in order to crash peasant weddings. And so what we, what we see in this painting is we see this idea that actually he is turning uh, people who are everyday people into kind of heroes. And that was really what uh, a lot of his paintings were about, were about sort of, it's been described as having the worm's eye view of the world, where he wanted to actually look up to all people. But that didn't just get into his pictures of everyday life. It also got into his pictures of the religious. So if you've looked at that previous resurrection of the figure of Jesus and you've kind of got used to this medieval haloed idea of perfection, this one might come as a little bit of a shock. So this is the Sermon of John the Baptist. And uh, we're going to look at a few different things here, but I think we're going to just start first with, with Leah just uh, noticing something that's particularly in the foreground of this picture. Yeah, so it's something that uh, Simon and I talked about while we we're preparing for this, is that um, a huge symbol in art is actually a, a dog, and what a dog symbolizes is loyalty. So what a dog is doing, what the behavior of the dog is doing, kind of talks about um, what uh, the character is of this person that they're interacting with. So if a dog is um, peeing next to somebody that doesn't say very good things about that person's character. So the artist is making a little bit of a nudge of, yeah, this guy is not a, not a good guy. Um, but in this painting, what you see is that the dog is actually um, close and cuddled up to the person who's the furthest away from Jesus, the one who you would assume um, during this time would be considered an outcast or further away from um, the, the typical uh, Western society. Um, and this dog is actually sitting on him next to him um, to show that his character is uh, something to be highlighted um, rather than disdained. Yeah, and, and when you look at this picture closely, what you begin to see is you begin to see that there's a whole bunch of these, these characters. So you've got a guy in a turban, uh, and, and you've got uh, sort of some monks on the side as, as particularly one particular group. And then this guy with a dog, what you notice, of course, is that he's, he's got you know, darker skin than, than the other people around him. So in many ways, he would have been seen as an, as an outsider. He's also fortune telling he's reading the uh, the palm of the person in front so religiously and socially he should have been an outsider but what Bruchel's trying to do here is trying to say that actually with the arrival of John the Baptist you know the kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is really a picture of perfection uh, in terms of the fact that everybody is now welcomed in and so we actually even get a kind of curious thing this with this of how Jesus just becomes part of the crowd kind of Jesus is there waiting in the wings of John the Baptist yeah and he also um, traditionally Jesus is always um, set apart in um, in art history so usually Jesus is wearing white and he is usually very um, calm and almost transcendent of um, earthly matters because he's Jesus and he's holy. And here you see um, Jesus who, yeah, he's still wearing lighter colors, so he's still highlighted, but he's actually wearing the same colors as uh, the background. So he's kind of blending into this, um, this, this earthliness of, of his surroundings. He's not so transcendent that he's high up um, amongst the clouds wearing white, um, but he's together and also um, apart in this, in this uh, scene. And what I think is kind of really interesting when we, um, when we look at this is actually this, this concept as well that, that Bruchel's painting in a time where this sort of scene, not as multicultural perhaps, but of large gatherings of people in fields was actually relatively uh, common. So it was a time where the Reformation had hit Europe. Bruchel is, as I said, part of the uh, Northern Renaissance. So he's there in the lowlands. He actually spent a lot of time around Antwerp. Um, and as such, he's got this idea that actually you would have seen this. You would have seen the preachers who would travel from field to field. You would have seen the whole concept that people who perhaps have been previously discluded by the Catholic Church 
were now in. But that was actually taking an even more interesting turn in a sort of propaganda sense. And as a, as a historian, one of the things I find kind of interesting about art is also not just how art forms culture, but how art actually um, mirrors culture or, or reflects what, what's happening in culture. And so when we look at somebody like Rembrandt, and we've brought it now all the way back into Amsterdam, uh, Rembrandt was an artist who actually was deliberately cultivated. So there was a, a man called uh, Constantine uh, Gauchens, or Gauchens, who was part of uh, the Dutch leading class. And he was aware of the fact that in other areas of Europe, there was a strong monarchical, uh, absolutist, sort of in a, in a modern term you would call it dictatorial, but absolutist is how it applies to, to a monarch, sense of kings are great and the average person isn't. So you have painters like Rubens uh, and his pupil Van Dyck famously painting these, these kings on, on horses, and we're going to come on to a kind of a, a ruler on a horse later on, with the whole idea of like, you know, look, here's the king, it's God on earth. But Rembrandt was employed to make pictures of average people look like gods on earth, or people made in the image of God on earth, or, in fact, to make God on earth look like average people. So we're going to look here at a picture called uh, The Woman Taken in Adultery, and fundamentally, it's a picture of, of Jesus in a famous biblical scene. And you can see it's got this, this sort of big temple scape in, 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 in the background. But in the foreground, the center point is uh, this story. And the story goes that there was a woman uh, caught in adultery and she met Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, the person who is without sin shall cast the first stone against this person you're depicting as a sinner. But what I find really interesting in this painting is the fact that although Jesus is in the foreground and this scene is in the foreground, actually it seems like a lot of people are ignoring it. So you've got this whole concept sweeping across the painting that most people are passing behind Jesus and then they're taking part in this pilgrimage that carries on up the stairs and they're heading up to the, a figure which we presume is a high priest sat on this wonderful kind of gold, gilded, almost pearl-like throne. And what you clearly got Rembrandt here saying is, actually, in looking to those riches, in looking to those sort of more uh, high, gilded images, you might actually be missing the real perfection that's right in front of you, which, of course, is then this image of Jesus. So we're going to just have a little look at, at the clothing here. Um, so, Leah, just over to you then, just to comment a little bit on that. Yeah, so um, again, we see um, Jesus exactly in the other piece that we were just looking at, where he's blending in with the background. So you, again, you don't have Jesus um, being um, white and um, um, very beautifully um, gilded and, and perfect, but instead you see Jesus who's just wearing these ordinary brown clothes. Um, and rather than him having this, this beautiful um, way of dressing, that's actually rendered onto the lady caught in adultery. So if you look at the way that her hair is um, made up, the jewels that she has, um, the, the belt that she has, even she has this really thin veil over her, uh, over her hair. Um, all of this, if you were looking at it in the 1600s, you would be thinking that this is um, a bride or somebody who's um, important. She's not wearing peasant's clothes. So already Rembrandt, with the choice of clothing, is putting the peasant's clothes on, on Jesus and giving the, the lady caught in adultery, she's getting the clothes of honor, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think there's, there's also a, th a theological point being made here as well. So in, in one sense, Jesus is taking the place of humility. So you can see, like, right by, by Leah, you kind of saw Jesus' is barefoot. Uh, Jesus is there below that big sort of higher up throne. On the other hand, Jesus is clearly the kind of the dominant figure in his party. And one of the things Rembrandt was really known for is actually how he depicted individual people really genuinely as individuals. And you almost see a movement on then from kind of uh, Bruegel towards these kind of really detailed facial images that you have here. 
And what is kind of fascinating as well with that is that, that Rembrandt deliberately did that by going and uh, using models from all around where he lived. And he even decided to live in a predominantly Jewish area of the city so that he could accurately depict uh, the Jewish Jesus and the Jewish Peter and the Jewish other, other figures of uh, those biblical pictures he was being commissioned to do. But the other theological point that's in here is that we can really see, if we again look at this kind of centre part here, that by being in white and Jesus uh, being in the darker clothes, Rembrandt's kind of transformed that classic imagery because the classic imagery is meant to be that Jesus is the haloed one. Jesus is the one with the kind of white symbol of holiness. But it's this very sort of uh, lowland Calvinistic idea of, no, Jesus has taken the sins off the woman. She now gets to look holy, whereas he has the more... uh, earthly kind of position so in that way it's a picture of perfection by saying the perfection of jesus gets transferred over so we're going to move on then to another artist we're going to bring it right up to date we've been kind of doing some of this historical one and we're going to move on to an artist introduced to us by leah who takes on this same theme of how do we see perfection in everyday people Yeah, so this artist that we're going to be looking at is an American artist. His name is Kahinda Wiley. Um, And whenever I think of um, um, Rembrandt and what he does of taking his models from the street, I think exactly also, I think, oh yeah, that's Kahinda Wiley because he does this thing called uh, street casting where he literally finds his models um, off the street in whatever cities he's working in. So if that's in the States or if it's in um, South Africa or if it's in Brazil, He drives around, finds somebody, says, do you want to be my model for my painting? Um, And what he also does is he plays with these really old um, ideas of either um, Renaissance or maybe 1600s, 1700s, this idea of, um, of wealth and fame and status, and he puts ordinary people into that place. So in order to understand a little bit of his... um, his yeah, battle between um, giving ordinary people honor, but also kind of pointing out how silly it all is to have all these people with so much power. Um, I'm going to show you um, a, an example of a piece that he based one of his off of. And this piece is um, by uh, Jacques-Louis David of Napoleon leading the army over the Alps. And the first thing um, that I'd like to point out about this piece is that um, it's factually untrue because Napoleon actually led the army over the Alps while he was riding a donkey. So um, you already have Napoleon completely not doing what he was supposed to be doing, riding this giant horse, which is also in art history, horses are a symbol of of power, of military power. Um, And especially if a horse is rearing, that means that this person is has the most power and the most um, might and he's also holding the the reins of the horse with one hand which even goes further to show that this guy is like the king of all kings and that's what he wants uh, you to know about him and so David absolutely um, also loved Napoleon because he hated the monarchy so much it's very um, ironic then that he loves an emperor, but that was his idea that he thought, yes, down with the monarchy, we finally have um, a, a people's person. So he uh, was very happy to um, paint uh, this very untrue, um, very military power uh, painting of, of Napoleon. And what I'd like to point out is some things that you'll see again it comes back to um, things that uh, Kahinda Wiley is going to be doing that I'm going to be pointing out. So here you see um, some names carved on the rocks. So we have um, Bonaparte. Well, that's Napoleon Bonaparte. And he's uh, higher up. And you see below him we have Hannibal and we also have um, Charlemagne. So he says um, with this that, yes, Hannibal and Charlemagne, they were great. But you know who's the best conqueror of all the conquerors? It's uh, Napoleon. So um, that's the first um, thing that I'd like to point out of just, again, this idea of he's so great, he's so amazing. We move on to this very elaborate form of dress. He's wearing these kind of, 
yeah, kind of like slipper boots um, and very gilded, uh, has a gilded sword. He really clearly doesn't look like he's going off the battle. It more looks like he's going to be coronated or something. Um, and at the very top um, on the horse's harness, you can see uh, that David put his um, name there just to let you know that he also had a little bit to do with um, this amazing painting. Um, and then the higher we go, we just see um, Napoleon's face, which is very um, sure and very calm, even though he's about to go off to, to battle, his horse is rearing and freaking out. He's very calm, collected, and pointing his troops onward over the Alps um, because he is the, the fearless leader. So this um, piece has everything to do with might and power um, and this masculinity that's, um, that comes at, during this time of what perfection is, and that is this very um, non-fearing um, um, power that is um, leading his army forth um, into greater things and conquering more peoples and more lands. And something that actually is super interesting about um, Napoleon is that he also, in some places, rein, um, rein, reinstated slavery, um, which was scrapped before that. So that's also a, point, a very important point as we go on to the next um, piece, which is the piece of Kenda Wiley. And if we flip back and forth between the two, you can see how similar they are. They are extremely similar. But there's a couple of things I'd really like to point out um, that show the differences. So the first thing, as we talked about these, uh, these rocks, we see that there's been an extra name added and the extra name is Williams, which is actually the name of the model that uh, Wiley found on the street. So it's this man's literal name. So it's not just a made up name. This, this man's real name is Williams. And yeah, he is not um, here below Hannibal and Charlemagne. Um, he's not here below Bonaparte. He's actually the highest on the list of this, this random dude that is um, ending up in a Wiley uh, painting is, is, is the highest. He's the, he's the conqueror of all other conquerors. Um, and then we move on to, if you remember these, these um, very silky boots and elaborate things um, that uh, Napoleon was wearing. We have this guy dressed in these like tacky camo pants and Timberlands. Um, so this very nep, um, fake um, military style of just this idea of this, this fakeness that's around it, of this fakeness of the painting, just to show that somebody has might and power. Um, Wiley also translate, but still you see the sword, you see the little like embellished um, coat that was kept with the, with the Napoleon piece. So this, he's really wanting to point out like, yeah, I, I'm stealing this painting because I think it's such a good example of how things went wrong in the past. And now I'm going to put somebody ordinary who has been historically oppressed. And I'm going to put them in the place of power to show that yeah, you guys have it all wrong. And um, again, on the harness, you see not the name of David, but you see the name of Wiley, who is the, who is the artist, which is all these little tiny details that I absolutely love. And then we go on to the face. Here we have Williams, we know his name. Um, again, fearlessly, very chill, pointing um, to where he's about to conquer wearing his uh, sweatbands and wearing his bandana, um, very chill, um, leading his um, theoretical army onwards. I mean, what's, what's going on with the background here? Because we're kind of noticing these kind of two themes coming across on the background. Yeah. Where you, don't, you no longer have an alpine scene, um, but you have this sort of almost tapestry-like effect at the background, like you would have seen, I suppose, around the time of Napoleon or, or even earlier, sort of 15, 16, 1700s. Uh, plus something else, which is interesting. Though. Yeah. So that's also something that Wiley does is he um, puts these very crazy backgrounds. If you look at any of his other stuff, he always has crazy backgrounds. Um, and this is exactly that, um, pointing back to the time of Napoleon, this very elaborate wallpaper, which is red and regal. 
Um, and then just, just to top off the little bit of um, the end, just in case you didn't understand that it was about this like, this very like conquering man, masculine power thing, um, Wiley puts a bunch of like little floating uh, sperms all over the place just to show, yes, it's about this theme of this ridiculousness of this conquering masculine man and I'm going to flip that on its head and I'm going to put um, somebody else in the seat of power. So this is uh, Kinda Wiley. He's got so many good ones. It was so hard to pick which uh, piece of his to choose because I think he just does them all incredibly amazing of um, this Rembrandt idea of finding somebody um, who is um, maybe marginalized, maybe oppressed, um, ostracized, and he puts them in a place of, uh, which was traditionally meant for uh, somebody to be honored or somebody who had some kind of status um, in the world, in this case, uh, Napoleon. So I think also moving on from, from this one, we then get on to Hans of Steich and we're, we're similarly going down that whole line yeah. of somebody ostracized but then placed in a position of honor. And, and this particular one we're going to come to now uh, was actually on display in about 100 meters down the road. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. So just want to tell us about, about this, this one from Hans Versteich. Yeah, so this is uh, Madonna de Mera Nostrum or Mantel, Mantel der Liefde, which means in Dutch uh, a cloak of, of love. Um, and this um, is a um, very classic scene of a Madonna and child, so uh, Jesus and Mother Mary. Um, but instead of um, Jesus and Mary being in the scene, you see um, a refugee um, mother and child who have just come from the stormy sea and they've just arrived on uh, land, probably in Greece or in Italy. Um, and they are covered with this uh, warming blanket, which you often see if you see uh, the news of, of this kind of terrible thing happening, of these refugees being wrapped in warming blankets. Um, but what he does is he pushes that idea a little bit further and he re re recalls this, um, this art history um, idea of the color gold, which color gold is a symbol of um, holiness when it's related to uh, the mother Madonna and child of this very regal gold background, which is supposed to symbolize this is holy people, this is holy ground, these are holy people. Um, this is not something um, ordinary. This is not just any person. This is not just any child. This is uh, Jesus uh, and he is God and this is his, his mother Mary. So that's exactly the same thing he's doing here is recalling that imagery and putting it literally uh, sh shrouding this, um, this mother and child in this uh, holiness. Yeah, and what I, what I also love here is I love kind of this, this concept actually of the kind of the high back to it as well. It's giving that kind of regal idea as well with the gold of, I suppose in the one sense it's kind of windswept, but in another sense it's actually portraying this whole, this whole concept of um, uh, the kind of royal uh, rather than the everyday. Um, we're going to, I'm going to kind of take this on them from this uh, whole concept back into uh, Rembrandt's. And uh, with, with Rembrandt, we get back then to uh, this concept of the baby Jesus. And what, the particular painting that I was really struck by as, as I was kind of looking at this whole concept was, was this one, which is uh, Simeon's Song of Praise. Now, when Rembrandt uh, died, he, he left a, a large number of, of paintings behind, but in particular sort of two famous kind of seen as uh, perhaps potentially unfinished works were there. One was The Return of the Prodigal Son, uh, which we, we actually did a show on a, a couple of uh, years ago, and the other one was this particular painting. And what this really demonstrates is also how Rembrandt looks at things at this particular stage of his life. So you've got this idea uh, within the whole concept of Simeon with the baby Jesus that Traditionally, the church has always had this as kind of an ending of the day moment. So Simeon is known for, for doing this uh, poetic, prophetic statement where he sort of meets Jesus and says, now may your servant go in peace 
this concept, you know, I've been waiting so long for this child and now this child is here. So therefore, what I've got to do has been done. And you also get that almost within Rembrandt uh, because he's, Rembrandt's coming to the end of his life. Rembrandt's uh, eyes have maybe faded a little bit. So the kind of whole sort of half shut eyes of Simeon really represent what's going on with Rembrandt. The same is true of the hands. You know, Rembrandt's thing that he could rely on as a personal uh, achievement was his hands. His hands were his ticket to wealth and fame and everything. But by this stage, his hands are, to some extent, failing him. And so you see here that Simeon's hands as well are not quite doing the job. They're not quite holding Jesus, but instead they're in this sort of half useless, half praying state, sort of rather like sort of Dura's praying hands, if you've ever seen them in the, in the etching or uh, perhaps in a tattoo. There's, there's, I think there's one of the most tattooed things in the world is, is Dura's praying hands. Um, but in this whole thing, you've got Jesus still in the middle, so sort of saying, actually, the perfection is in this very small baby uh, in amongst the failure uh, of the ability of Simeon to actually sustain himself, and in that sense, of Rembrandt to sustain himself. So that brings us on to uh, another key theme, which is the whole idea of cycles of life, that uh, Rembrandt's getting old, he's, he's, he's depicting new birth and death at the same time. And we see this whole idea that actually there is something of perfection in those cycles of life depicted in a, in a large number of other works of art around Amsterdam. Um, one of the most recent being a particular uh, mosaic created by uh, Leah Sands. So Leah, <laughs> I need to ask you about what was behind the creation of uh, this particular um, mosaic. Yeah, um, so here you can see the piece um, in all of its glory. It's um, a mosaic that we worked on for two and a half months um, in the place called Gist, which is a spiritual, uh, a Christian uh, spirituality um, um, yeah, place where there's a lot of things going on. But uh, we were asked to do um, this as a slow process of art making and it was definitely very slow because it took um, quite a few of us uh, two and a half months to create but um, here it is in all of its glory and then if i bring it in a little bit you can see uh, the theme that's going on um, so there's two things that we uh, wanted to do with this piece um, and the first one was um, the theme came from a, a painting that I made and what I actually wanted to do was um, um, redepict um, a Bible verse that you normally have very normal or uh, very uh, specific imagery with. Um, so it's Isaiah 40, uh, 31, and it says, um, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings, uh, wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not grow faint. And this idea of perseverance and hope and what you normally think of as eagles wings because it says that but what i really wanted to pull out was a different way of of looking at this um this theme and it brought me to um in more of an eastern culture you have um the symbol of a lotus which does exactly this is this idea of perseverance of hope of um continuing to strive towards the light because what a lotus does is it grows from the the darkest places of a pond or yeah a swampy area and it grows from this place where there's hardly any uh, light whatsoever and it grows all the way up towards the surface until finally um, it blooms once it's um, at the surface once it's finally reached uh, the light so um, if we zoom in you can see also in this um, piece that we have the the final stages of of the journey of the the bloom finally reaching uh, the sun and it's almost fully eclipsing uh, the sun as it's reaching um, upwards but then um, next to that is the is another theme of this idea of these cycles of life where um, there's there's death and resurrection and there's this cyclical thing of um, death and renewal of, of also renewing strength and having hope. Um, so in the bottom um, left corner here, you see um, a half 
dead, well, basically fully dead. Um, it's all mosaic in uh, brown and a dead um, um, lotus that has finally sunk down back to the depths um, and has um, perished. But next to it, you have still more um, new uh, buds coming up. Um, which is this juxtaposition of this death and life and renewal and, um, and continuing to go forward and go up and to ascend um, that um, is really beautiful as a part of nature. And so uh, one of the other things that I, I love about this is, is when, I, when I look at this whole uh, mosaic and I look at the, you know, these, these bright yellows and these flowers rising, I also just think this is this is so Amsterdam, because Amsterdam is this uh, city that's also known for uh, these artists who would make wonderful flower paintings. Uh, it's known for the, the place of tulip mania, and so they had this whole concept actually of people would quite often have flower paintings as one of the key elements of their their rooms. Also, of course, it's known as being, for, for one particular period of time, the, the home place of Vincent van Gogh, who's also got this kind of key idea in the sunflowers. You've got these bright yellow flowers, yeah. and yet, when you look closely, you realise that most of those flowers are actually dead or dying, and the seeds are going to drop, and there's the whole concept of the seed dropping to the ground and then being reborn there. So I just, I love the fact that this, this fits in. I also realise at this point that, that we should have said to everybody who's watching live, one of the benefits of watching live is you can ask us about any of these, these paintings. So if you've got any questions, just put them on the chat. And we've got Evan over here in our, in our corner who's actually ready to, uh, to, to tell us the questions. So if you've got any questions about uh, Leah's mosaic or about any of our other particular uh, paintings or artworks, then please just put, put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them during the course of the evening. But since I've mentioned flower paintings, I want to move on to the person who I think is probably uh, the greatest uh, flower painter of uh, what is still sometimes known as the Dutch Golden Age, although some people think that that should be renamed in, in light of some of the slavery issues that have been highlighted by, by Lear today. But in that kind of particular era of the late 1600s through to the 1700s, I think the most uh, significant painter was a lady called Rachel Rausch. And you should really definitely look her up because she has a super interesting and long life. But I want us to just concentrate on one particular one of her, her paintings here. I've not managed to fit the full name in here. Uh, this is Roses and Convolvus and Poppies and Other Flowers in an Urn on a Stone Ledge. But what this picks up is many of the same themes that we've really been talking about uh, with uh, Leah's painting as well. So, at the centre, you've got this real vibrancy of life, and actually, it's it's even unreal life. These flowers wouldn't have all bloomed at the same time. And one of the amazing things about these flower painters is that they could memorise flowers, so that they could paint flowers together with other flowers that weren't really there. But if you actually look away from this kind of central blooming area, you then come down. And what you notice is that along with this kind of big life, there is this death. So you've got these other uh, sort of caterpillar-eaten uh, little leaves lower down. And of course, then, the, the butterflies and, and, and moths that are really rising up from them. And you've got a similar thing. If we kind of look up here, we've got this whole concept as well. You've got this one wilted flower that is really uh, part of that cycle of death. Uh, the interesting thing about this is, is that this, again, was, a, was actually a very sort of 1600s theme. Um, of course, the Dutch loved their beautiful flower paintings, but also they were part of this whole uh, of a concept known as uh, vanity paintings. And the idea behind a vanity painting was that you would have not just the things that were in full bloom, but also the things that were dying. And so you had this idea that actually you could see this kind of uh, perfection of the cycles of life by actually having sort of these little slugs or snails that were trailing along the bottom of the picture, rotting fruit, uh, and so on. And you see, I mean, this is not a classic, complete vanity painting. It's not simply there to remind people of that. And, and the idea that they were reminding themselves of was, you know, I, as a person, am just like a flower fading. Uh, you know, the grass withers and dies. Uh, so, 
yes, there's a glory, but don't forget in your glory that you shouldn't rise up and be too, too sort of um, proud of yourself. Uh, again, very much a kind of a Calvinistic theme that we were kind of picking up in one of our talks a month or so ago. And also within this, you also see that there's obviously a little focus here on the butterfly, and the butterfly uh, certainly became a symbol as well of, of, of resurrection. So you've got this idea that you've got this just transition from uh, the, the caterpillar that becomes uh, then later the butterfly through this sort of resurrection uh, concept. So that's Rachel Rausch. As I say, if you've never heard of her before, look her up and look up vanity paintings because they are just a fascinating way of looking at perfection in a, in a different sort of way. But we're going to move on to a more uh, modern version of this, which is uh, Ori Gersht. Uh, so, Leah, do you want to tell us a little bit about Ori Gersht? Yeah, Ori Gersht is uh, he's an uh, Israeli artist, and um, he makes these really amazing, and we'll show you just in a little bit, um, these... Um, um, I don't really know how to call them films or moving photography or digital art pieces, but they're a little bit of everything. Um, this one is um, a film, um, and he takes this idea of um, of the, these these vanities of this death and life, but rather than having this slow process of like going from death or from life into death and then back again, he's actually an artist that survived um, three different wars. So he uh, kind of puts it in a different light and he says, no, it's not this slow process, it's actually this very startling process and it's a destructive process and it's a messy process um, because again, he has lived through things that most of us have never um, experienced or uh, seen in our, in our own lives. And um, so he takes this exact same theme that Simon was talking about and he um, has this uh, crazy um, um, inter interpretation of it. So I'd like to show you a piece of his called um, Big Bang and you'll understand why it's called that. So here he's actually exploding um, and, uh, a bouquet of flowers and here it is in slow motion and you're, most of this film you're able to watch just this destruction which is happening very quickly but he's slow mowing it so that you can see how every little piece of flower that's falling and just being blown to pieces um, of what destruction looks like um, because again it's usually something that happens very quickly and then we, we we move on we see something very destructive happening in the world and we move on um, but with um, his piece, he really wants to dwell on it, of also this idea of um, this death and life, but in a different manner than, uh, than, than these vanity uh, painters. And so, yeah, was, we, we kind of come, come back then to, to Return of the Herd, which we, you, first off, we're kind of using this painting to talk about the idea of actually seeing perfection in average people, which is certainly, certainly something that Bruchel was doing. But also within this is Bruchel also loved these cycles of life. As I said, you, you probably know some of the sort of brothers or sisters of this painting through the, the famous harvesters in the summertime and through uh, the, 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 hunter, sorry, the, the winter paintings. Hunters in the Snow, I think, was not part of this series, but another one of his famous winter paintings. And what we really see here, again, is this whole concept of cycles. So if you look at this painting right up close, You've got the idea that, that down here in the valley is this kind of idyllic little settlement. It's got its own church. It's in the sunshine. But clearly, the guys who are returning the herd have left that. They've wandered up the hill, and they're wandering forward in very much a, a pattern of being at one with nature. So you can actually see that, for example, some of the, the herdsmen here have almost got exactly the same, same colours to... Uh, their tunics as the cows themselves. So there's this kind of peaceful um, oneness with nature that really comes out again with these cycles of life. And of course, where they're heading to is this other little village, which you can see just dimly in amongst the branches is also, you know, almost identical, but obviously the winter home. It's, it's the place with another little church and so on. But what you see as well as we zoom back is that this is all up against this sort of dark sky and fundamentally an idea that 
at some point in these big cycles of life, the sky is coming in. And if you want to look up Bruchel, you can also see that he, he has this famous painting of death, where in a similar way as death is coming onto the scene and death is the leveler of all people, it's the, the one thing that none of us can escape, uh, death is symbolized as well in, in that painting by the sky coming in uh, across the side. But the other curious thing about this is that, that Bruchel, as I, I mentioned, he was inspired by some of the Italians, but interestingly, he went down to study with the Italians, didn't actually pick up many of their sort of painting mannerisms, but did pick up along his way a love of the Alps. And so what you see in this painting is much as we might think, oh, he's just depicting a normal scene, actually, there's an element of this which is really quite sort of uh, symbolic and, and to some extent abstract. He's He's actually got this, this scene as the sort of scene that you would actually see uh, in amongst sort of Flemish countryside, but then these big mountains that are far more alpine. And so he's actually sort of picturing perfection by moving into the realm of imagination. And that's our last real theme for uh, today, which is how we get into that kind of idea that some artists are picturing perfection not by seeing perfection in the everyday, not by seeing perfection necessarily in the cycles of life, but seeing perfection actually in the world of imagination. And since we're on the topic of skies, I thought that the, the perfect place to stay or to start with is our friend Vincent van Gogh. Now, many of you will know this painting. I think for, for many people, this is sort of seen as being a perfect image. For other people, it's seen as being quite troubling. For, for Vincent himself, uh, it was a painting which is really interesting because it's a painting that he had for a long time on his mind. He talked about this as being kind of mental image long before it was a real image, particularly because he began to talk about this starry sky. But at the same time, it was a painting that was to some extent seen as a bit of a, a failure. He, he sent it off to Theo, his brother, and you know, to some extent his idol in life, and Theo wasn't a fan, and so Vincent wasn't necessarily a fan. But what's going on here is we've got this really bright sky. And if you're thinking, wow, this is so much different from the previous paintings, it's also because of... Sorry, just a reminder there of our non-perfect world with a police car going past. Um, but we've also got this whole concept here. And dogs howling. And dogs howling, all sorts of things going on. Um, but we've also got this concept here with this, with this sky that um, it's, a, it's a swirl which is either kind of beautiful or really troubling. Uh, there are mathematicians who say this is a perfect um, sim symbolism of, um, not symbolism, perfect depiction of actually turbulence. And there are some psychologists who've even gone on further to say that the only reason that Van Gogh was able to do that so well was actually because of the turbulent state of his mind at this time. Because where he was painting this from was in uh, saint Remy, uh, where he was in an asylum. Uh, he'd self-admitted himself to, to, to an asylum for his mental health, and he then painted scenes from his window, and this was one of them. But what's really curious is I actually think the key here to, to Vincent's look for perfection is actually seen as we zoom in across this and we come down to uh, the church. So we're just kind of like going to look in here. And one of the things about it is, is that, that Vincent talked quite a lot about stars and starry skies when he lived in Amsterdam, when he was studying to be a minister. And then he spent a decade not mentioning starry skies at all. And then he returned to Starry Skies uh, with his stars over the Rhone and with this picture. And what's curious is that, much like with Bruegel, you didn't really get those alpine mountains in Belgium. You didn't really get churches like this in saint Remy. This spired church is a classically Dutch church. So you've got the idea here that Van Gogh is looking at the stars and is remembering back to that period of time when actually he was studying for the ministry. But if you notice what's going on in the church, you'll also notice that uh, the church is completely dark while everything around is light. 
So it's almost like Vincent is saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm discovering this perfection, and this perfection, to some extent, is actually in these blues. Uh, Vincent talked about the idea that blue to him was the colour of the infinite. Yellow to him was one of the colours of happiness in the sun. So you've got the idea of the infinite and of the, the also the godly, he would see it as the godly and, and happy in the yellows. But you can see, if you look really closely at the church, it's something the church is entirely lacking. And as we were looking at this picture together, um, Leah was just also noticing something particular about the, the link here between the, the church and what's coming into the shot here, which is a cypress tree. Yeah, so there's one thing in art that you always, the composition always means um, something. So here you have this very turbulent, beautiful um, sky, um, which is a symbol of, of the otherworldly, of the transcendent. And then you also have then below, uh, separated between the sky and then the, the, the earth and where people live and the buildings. And um, between these things, you have two things that... Um, bridge the gap between uh, this, these two layers. So you have the sky and you have the, the earth and there's only two objects in this entire painting that um, touch both. And the first on the right you see that the church steeple is like a little tiny bit touching into this, this transcendence, into this, this otherworldly. Meanwhile, you have this cypress tree that is growing and completely outshining, eclipsing uh, the church in its reach into this ethereal, into this otherness. So you have this giant cypress, a, a tree that is f far more reaching into um, um, the this, this spiritual or the ethereal than, than the church is. And, and I think there's, there's really three kind of things that we can actually really look at here when we want to look at what Vincent's doing in terms of picturing the perfect. One is, is like we can look backwards. So when we look at Vincent's time in Amsterdam, he actually talks and he, he regularly quotes this poem where he says, you know, God's voice is heard underneath the stars. So you've got this idea that, you know, the stretch of the stars is this peace with God. On the other hand... The darkened church and the move to the Cyprus really indicates the fact that having been rejected by the church, Vincent moved to this concept that actually he could find the perfect, and he could find connection with God through nature. And thirdly, you've got this idea that actually the Cyprus was a symbol of the link, be link between death and life. And one of the letters that, that Vincent was to write later to his brother was actually to talk about the idea of the fact that death could be like a trip to the stars and to the heavenly in the same way that uh, simply taking a train could be the ticket to somewhere else on the map. So he basically talked about, you know, the stars always reminded him of the pinpoints you would have of certain towns on the map. But we, we kind of love this picture because it, or I certainly love it, I've been asked Leah whether she loves this I picture. Also like it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I love this picture really because, you know, it does combine so many of those elements uh, of the different things we've been talking about, the, the, the life and death, uh, the real and the unreal. Vincent is also classic for this in so many other ways. Also, uh, the, the, the highlighting of people, which really can be seen in the potato, eater, e, potato eaters, the cycle of life in the sower, and also sort of that, that idea of the, the holiness of the conventional or the ordinary person. But we also see in here the transition. In, the, in this post-impressionist world, uh, Vincent has taken things beyond what is real into what is symbolic. So primarily he's trying to symbolize stuff. And we move from that really further on into the era of, of the modern. And so we get on to uh, our final Amsterdam of the evening, our penultimate uh, artist of the evening, which is Piet Mondrian. And Mondrian lived for a long time in Amsterdam, uh, far longer than Vincent van Gogh did. Vincent was uh, only here for uh, a couple of years, but, but Piet Mondrian was, was here for over a decade. And there's all sorts of art of Piet Mondrian that you can see taken during his time in Amsterdam, much of it of things like uh, windmills and trees and so on. But what, of course, he's really famous for is something quite different, which is probably pictures like this. Lozenge composition. So, Leah, what's going on with this picture? 
Well, um, I think it's quite, this is a classic uh, modern art example where people say, I could have done that. Um, but what really is going on is um, you see um, a couple of things that are the essence of what art is or image making is. So you have primary colors, which makes up all color. So you have yellow, red, blue. You have black and white because those are the extremes of, um, t of shades. Um, and then you have the basic elements of line and shape. So you either have uh, one dimensional lines uh, or you have two dimensional shape. Basically these are the essence of what makes up uh, a painting. So um, what I learned in art history class is that uh, what Mondrian was trying to do with this was trying to wrestle with the essence of what is the essence of composition? What is the essence of a painting? What makes a painting a painting in the same way as what makes a human a human? What is the essence of, of human? And for him, that was uh, his soul. And so as he was wrestling with this, this idea of um, composition and what makes, what's the bare minimum that you could possibly make, he's also asking this question of what's the bare minimum of who I am and who am, who I am in relation to God as well. And I think one of the other interesting things is kind of from the historians, the pure historians rather than the art historians point of view, is also where exactly this fits in a timeline. So if we looked right at the start, this Laulaka land or the land of cocaine, this, this sort of utopian idea where you get everything, actually Mondrian is also a utopian. He, through doing his painting, was trying to say, you know, if I can get to these very basic forms, maybe almost we can get to something everyone agrees on. We can get to a utopian society because we won't have all these differences anymore. And in that sense, it, it's significant that he's, he's working in these forms primarily after the First World War. So he's seen so much death and destruction and he's trying to say, hey, how do we step beyond death and destruction? How do we step into a world where actually uh, things are perfect? And for him, what he talked about is he talked about, you know, to get to the purely spiritual, you have to leave the real behind. So if you want to look this up later, you can look at all these sort of things of how actually this developed, where Mondrian is sort of going around the edges of Amsterdam and doing very realistic paintings of trees. But then those slowly become trees which become right angle forms, which work their way through to where we've, we've got it in the end with this sort of basic form of, of painting. Um, one of the other things that I find really curious about this is um, that this was also the inspiration for two other utopias, one of which is uh, Nietzsche or Miffy. So uh, Dick Bruner, the artist, came up with this character that, that many of you will have seen of this kind of perfect, happy children's world. And he went with exactly the same idea from Mondrian of the, the black and white thick lines, the, the bold primary colours, to, to symbolise what was going on in that world. I mean, he added a few in, you know, had to have green for the grass and so on for the kids. Um, but that was basically what was going on. And the same thing actually was true of Lego. So when we kind of think of these idealistic Lego worlds, that the, the founder of Lego was also there saying, hey, uh, there was an inspiration from Mondrian's uh, bright yellows and blues and reds to actually get towards this, this perfect world. So we're going we're gonna to stay, though, with this for our last artist, uh, which is one I do not know much about. But you do. I do know more about um, this artist. Her name is um, Agnes Martin. She was mainly making art in the, the 60s and 70s. Um, and um, I really, really love her. Um, she, a lot of people um, misidentify her as a minimalist artist. And you'll see um, what I mean um, when I introduce her, the piece to you. But um, she actually called herself a abstract expressionist. So she put herself way more with Mark Rothko and all these other um, um, artists who were really trying to put emotion into an, an artwork. So she was very firm with her, um, with her categorization of I'm not painting a uh, reason or I'm not painting uh, um, whatever you think I'm doing. I'm painting emotion. I'm trying to paint uh, beauty and, and stillness and perfection. And she's actually um, called the, the midwife to awareness. That is kind of her, her name that she has in the, in the art world. So um, here you can see a piece. Um, 
And I'm really sad that you can't see as we zoom in as well, but if, if you can kind of see, there's these really, really thin pencil lines that go across this white canvas. So she painted this canvas with multiple layers of white, different kinds of whites, and then she drew um, by hand without a ruler, no, no measurements, she drew this, these perfect pencil lines in a grid form. Um, and this was for her um, a way of welcoming people into um, contemplation, into stillness. For her, um, the idea of um, beauty was often found um, in stillness. And later on in her life, she was first, uh, she's, she's a Canadian artist, and then she moved to uh, Washington for a little bit, and then she moved to uh, New York to study, and then towards where she's making most of her art, she's actually living in New Mexico in the desert. So if you look at a lot of her art, it's these very um, sand-colored um, pieces or very light blue, very dusky or dawn pieces where you can really see that she's getting her inspiration from the stillness and the nothingness of the desert, of this flat plain going towards meeting another flat plain of, of color. And um, from there, she says, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, an ex I'm an expressionist because I want people to engage in stillness in order to find the beauty. And there's a really, really beautiful quote of hers that I like. Um, she says, when I think of art, I think of beauty. Beauty is the mystery of life. It is not in the eye, it is in the mind. And in our minds, there is an awareness of perfection. So I think that is so perfect with also with this talk. And I didn't know of, of, this, of this quote before uh, we had the talk and then I wanted to find some more things out about her and I found this, uh, this quote and I thought it was such a beautiful way of, of, of what she aimed to do with art is finding things that are, that the, the beauty is existing in our, in our minds and, and in the world, but um, in a way that we we are aware of it. Uh, we have to create this awareness in order to find beauty. Um, yeah, so that's uh, something really beautiful about her stuff. Yeah, and I actually love that as a kind of a closing, closing thought, of, thought of the time. Because there are, there are various things in, in which, I, you know, we were talking about the fact that, you know, it almost comes uh, full circle. You, you, you notice that drawing even by freehand, there's still a sort of mathematical perfection to what Agnes Martin is, is creating in the same way where we started right at the start with that, that, that mathematical perfection in the resurrection uh, picture. But also I just love that whole concept of the fact that there is this uh, element of it's not just about what is real, but actually what is in, in the mind. And, and that's, that's the kind of big theme, I think, that's, that's run through a lot of these, uh, these artists that, you know, for some of them, it is uh, re-envisaging the cycles of, of life and death to actually see, you know, even perfection in sort of Rachel Rausch's kind of half-eaten leaves, uh, but also this idea of to see perfection in the everyday lives of people or to see perfection in, in the abstract and, and the actual stepping back to the, the world of the, of the mind and of the spirit. And so with that, we, we kind of bring our lecture part to an end. If you do have questions then we haven't received any yet on the chat, but you can always throw a question on the chat uh, and we'll, we, can, we can be here ready for any questions for the next couple of minutes. Um, one of uh, the things I'd just like to say though is, is thank you for, for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe because we will be doing some uh, more talks in the future. We've got a talk coming up next month on the, the life of Corrie ten Boom from uh, somebody who, uh, who knew her. And we're also hoping to post a few more sort of short art clips to say more about some of the pictures we've seen tonight or, and a couple of other pictures that we haven't seen tonight. So, so do click on the subscribe button. And in the meantime, if you're staying for questions, we'll hear from you. And if you're not, uh, I hope that, like Agnes Martin would hope, you have a very restful night and are able to either strive for or rest in perfection. <laughs>